Well, this morning we're going to talk about going viral. Just kidding. I had the privilege this week. It's overrated. Uh, no, this morning we're going to talk about wisdom. We're going to talk about wisdom. We love to be thought wise. We do. Don't you love that? Somebody says, you're smart, you're intelligent, you're wise. You're wise beyond your years. That sure feels good to us, doesn't it? And it is an age of wisdom. It's actually an age of wizards, really. Gandalf, Dumbledore, LeBron James working magic on the basketball court by flopping. It's all magic. It's a day of wizardry. But we like to be thought of as wise, don't we? Mankind has always fancied himself wise. That's what happened in the garden. The promise, the lie was, take and eat and you will be wise like God. Eve saw that the fruit was, was desirable to make one wise, it says. The original lie. And as Paul puts it, professing to be wise when man sinned, they became fools. But true wisdom is still out there. Real wisdom is still available to men, and it's not what men think it is. Our verse has something to say about it this morning. May we escape the fate of a false wisdom that just exalts self and is actually foolishness. And may the Lord grant us today to understand what I've called it Wisdom 101. What it says in verse 10 here. The beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We're going to put two questions to our verse here. First, what is it? What is Wisdom 101? And second, why it matters? And that'll be our sermon. What is the beginning of wisdom? It says right here, it's the fear of the Lord. Amen? The fear of the Lord, how much clearer can it get? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Don't you love the Bible? It tells it just like it is. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear is the first step in being wise. Not self-confidence, not bravado, not courage. Fear is the beginning of being wise. Now this word fear here, as one preacher wisely said, in the Hebrew it means fear. That's why they translated it that way. It means fear. It doesn't merely mean a respect for God, although it includes that. It doesn't merely mean a religious, spiritual reverence for God, although it includes that as well. But it is, in fact, something more than just respect or reverence. Psalm 2, verse 11 says this in a parallel. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with, what does it say? Who knows the verse? Rejoice with trembling, is what it says. When the Bible says fear, it means the kind of things that make your knees knock together and your teeth chatter. Trembling. Fear. And that's what the fear of God is. And that, to know God as God, as the one who is to be feared, is the very beginning of all true wisdom. Like I said, this fear, fear includes a reverence or a respect, but it's much more than the way that you feel towards your parents or towards your grandparents and respecting and honor them. It's much more than the reverence you might feel for a very, very old book or an heirloom in the family that's been passed down for hundreds and hundreds of years. There's a respect for that. There's a reverence for that. But it's not necessarily a fear. This kind of fear is more the way you might feel if a lion walked into the room. Scared! <laughs> is it bad to be scared of a lion? It's a good thing. It's the way you might feel if you saw a tornado right on the other side of the highway coming towards us. You know how we'd feel? Fearful! <laughs> and that's proper. 
it's good to fear those things. Now, we went to the zoo the other day, and they got the tiger place, and you know, you're way up on the bridge. But I noticed some of the trees around the bridge, they have all this metal around them, and these, these, they put, basically put roofs on the trees. And what we realized is, yo, that's because the tiger will climb that tree and jump up right on this bridge I'm standing on. <laughs> May the metal hold to the tree. It's a fearful thing. We're not talking about a lion. We're not talking about a tornado. We're talking about God. And God is to be feared. Because He's God, it's right to fear God. Because He's all those things and more. Right? The fear of the Lord here It's not just a fear of absolute terror and scaredness of God, but it is a proper fear, never forgetting who it is that we're dealing with, God. As we're going to see this morning, it's not even a fear that He's going to judge me so much as He sure could if He wanted to. It's not so much a fear of God is going to destroy me For the believer, it's not this, but it certainly is. He sure could. (laughs) He's God. Have you ever heard the the noon bell or the noon horn, you know, the tornado warning? Elliot Delorme called it a hurricane horn some years ago. I don't think we're getting hurricanes here, but that, that long sound that rings out. They used to do the noon bells in the towns. And sometimes we get it around here. If there was a storm coming, if danger was coming, this city would be resounding with those very loud and fearful sounds. Wouldn't it? The air would be resonant with that sound that tells us something's wrong. Take warning. Take heed. Something's coming. You should be fearful. That's what that sound means. Now, if you were to read the Bible... In a situation where the children of Israel came to the mountain and met their God, and God appeared to them on the mountaintop, it says the sound of a loud trumpet went forth and kept getting louder and louder because something was coming. And they were to take heed. And they were to be scared because God was coming. So the word here, fear, means fear. What is the beginning of wisdom? If we truly want to be wise, it involves this fear. Now, the text says it is the fear of the Lord. You notice it doesn't say the fear of God, even though that's true. It says the fear of the Lord, all caps, Yahweh, His covenant name with Israel. I am who I am. The fear of Him is the beginning of wisdom. This is a distinction that's worthy of note. Certainly the fear of God, the general fear of God, the fear of God, the God we know by nature, the God who knows everything, sees everything, the God who will bring us into judgment. But the Lord, who is the same God, is as he is revealed to us in the Bible further. It's the God of special revelation. And interestingly, Solomon here doesn't just say the God of general revelation is to be feared, but once you know who he is in the Bible, once you really learn who God is in the Scriptures, you don't have to fear him anymore. That's not what he says. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. The special revelation of who he is. Now again here, in the Proverbs, like the Psalms, we have poetic expression. We have parallelism here in our verse where Solomon is going to state the same thing twice, and it helps us understand what's going on. So at the beginning of verse 10 here in Proverbs 9, he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And he's going to echo that statement. Perhaps he's going to advance it a little, but he's going to echo it in the second part of the verse, the knowledge of who? The Holy One is insight. The Lord is the Holy One. To know that God is holy, 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 what that means strikes fear into your heart. What does it mean that God is holy? Does it just mean that he's really, 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 really good? Well, he is that. Does it mean that he's Mr. Pristine and pure? Sure. God is pure and he has no sin. But what holiness really means is that God is other. That's what the word means. He's different. He's not like us. 
He's unique. He is separate from us. He's in a category all by himself. He's the Holy One. And when the mighty seraphs that fly in his presence, the angelic majesties that serve at the seat of God's throne, when they call out that God is holy, they cover their very faces and they cover their very feet in the presence of God because that he is holy means that he is to be feared. He's not like us. He's different. He will judge sinners. There is no mercy at the final judgment seat of God apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no mercy. There is no second chance. He's not like us. He is just. And He is to be feared. The fear of of this God revealed in the Old and New Testaments, all that we know about Him, His wrath and His grace, His holiness and His mercy, He's to be feared, the full package of God is to be feared. Now, this is a mark of the godly, and it always has been, beloved, and it always will be, the fear of the Lord. It used to be said, in fact, even in our own society, as a compliment, yo, such and such is a God-fearing person. That language has all but disappeared. A God-fearing man, a God-fearing woman. It has to be a good thing. It's almost a bad thing in modern evangelicalism to talk about the fear of God. They, what do you mean you fear God? But it's always been the mark of the godly. Moses says this about him in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 21. When he came to the mountain, the writer of Hebrews is reflecting upon it, and he said that Moses said this, I tremble with fear. When God appeared on Mount Sinai to the people of Israel, Moses himself was quivering with fear. He was terrified. And again, I looked into the Greek here, and you know what it says? I tremble with fear. Tremble. I shudder with fear. I am terrified and I am trembling in the presence of God. If you have never done that, if you've never felt the shudder through your soul of what it is to stand before the living God, maybe you don't know Him. Because Moses knew what that was like. And of course, the writer of Hebrews does contrast that with what we have in Christ, but we'll never understand what we have in Christ rightly until we pass through that shuddering. Facing God in His pristine holiness and law apart from Christ will shatter the sinner. This word trembling here, this is the definition of it. It means being in a quivering condition because of exposure to an overwhelming or threatening circumstance. That's what it means. Quivering. Moses feared God. Abraham feared God. Genesis 17, when the Lord appeared to him and said, be blameless. You know what Abraham did in verse 3? Fell on his face before God. He didn't buddy-buddy with the Lord. He fell down, struck with fear before God. Isaiah, we well know Isaiah's experience with the Lord in chapter 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. What's Isaiah's response? Did you sing the latest modern worship song on KTIS with great joy and dancing? Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and I have seen the Lord of hosts. Woe is me. That's the response he has to meeting God. It's not just Moses and Abraham and Isaiah. We could get into David. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. That's what he told us this morning in Psalm 34. We talk about Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, apart from Christ, the wisest mere mortal who ever lived, who can't shut up about the fear of the Lord in the book of Proverbs. So we move on to the New Testament. Perhaps there the fear of the Lord disappears, right? Maybe it's the Old Testament God who is to be feared. But the New Testament God is to be loved, simply, and not feared. I was challenged on this this week. And somebody said, the Bible never tells us to fear Him. And my response was, quote, fear Him. 
Matthew 10, 28. Now, you know who said that? Jesus said that. Fear him, God. Okay, so Jesus said it, but surely he was talking to his enemies. No, Jesus was talking to his disciples, his faithful disciples who were about to be persecuted by the world. And to them, you know what he said? Don't fear them who can kill the body and after that can do nothing, but fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Jesus, our teacher, said to his disciples who trusted in him, fear God. Did Jesus know what it was to fear God? My Bible says that when he stood before the judgment of God on the cross, he sweat blood. You think he sweat blood because he was happy? Jesus sweat blood because he was in such anguish, and fear over what he knew was coming. Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. Because he knew in that cup was the judgment of God, and Jesus knew what it would be to receive the omnipotent fury of God against sinners. And he was fearful. The book of Hebrews says, in the days of his flesh, he, he gave supplications and loud cries, and he was heard because of his reverence for God. I'm a God the Son, but in human form, in His human nature, Jesus is the preeminent God-fearing man. And if you think He strolled up to the cross, you're wrong. He Himself struggled with the judgment of God. He feared God. Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 11. Okay, now Paul, the gospel of grace now. Jesus died and rose again. Now it's all good, right? Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 11. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Did you know your Bible says that? About apostolic gospel evangelism. Knowing the terror of the Lord. Do you know the terror of the Lord? Can you say that you know what it is to tremble before God? Because Paul could say that. And he said, that's the very thing that makes me seek the souls of men because of what's coming. Paul passed through this. Okay, that's, that's Paul. He's aggressive. He's, you know, super rowdy. What about the apostle of love, John? Surely John has nothing to say about the fear of God. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, when he saw Jesus, his beloved, he says, when I saw him, I, started, I got out my guitar and I played the latest contemporary worship song. When I saw him, I put on my dancing shoes. I got on my tambourine. When I saw him, I posted about it on Facebook. <laughs> no, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. Like a dead man. God is to be feared. The Lord Jesus Christ is to be feared. My friends, do you fear God? I wonder if we fear God as we ought. I wonder if we have a proper understanding of who it is we're dealing with. I wonder when we send off our prayers or when we struggle with sin and give in, you know, uh, when we harbor grudges against each other or, or nurture that bitterness within us towards another image bearer, let alone someone bought with the blood of Christ. I wonder if we fear God. I wonder if we remember that He sees us and knows us and knows all things. You know, it's certainly a fearful thing if you have a secret in your life that you don't want out and somebody finds out about it. It's not a fearful thing. It's a liability. Because you wonder, man, maybe they'll tell someone who can do something about it. But in God, He's the full package. He both knows and He will do something about it. Isn't that fearful? To know that we are an open book before God and even right now, He knows our motives, He knows our thoughts, He knows our disposition. We can't hide from Him. He's God. I wonder if we fear God. The fear of God is, in fact, a new covenant promise for Christians. Okay. Jeremiah 32, 40, God's promise of the new covenant. You know what he says? I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. If you're a child of God through faith in Christ, God did that. He put the fear of him in your heart. If you don't fear God, you're not a Christian. If you've never feared God and you've never stood before the judgment throne and seen what your sins deserve, 
if death has never flashed before your eyes and you know that God will be perfectly just to send you to hell forever. If you've never experienced that, you don't know God. It's the beginning of wisdom. It's the very beginning of life. Now, of course, the pushback here is, does not the Bible say, does not 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 say that perfect love casts out all fear? Does it say that? You bet it does, and it means that. But what kind of fear is John talking about? Perfect love casts out all fear. He says fear has to do with punishment. The Christian who fears God and is trusting in Christ, they don't fear that punishment's going to come. They're assured that they belong to God in Christ. <laughs> They're just being very rational. They're still dealing with God. He's not safe. He's God. And you never graduate from that. In eternity, well, that won't that be a thrill to be in the very presence of God and know who He is? It will not be without fear. People pay big money to go on rides to feel fear. We love it. We were designed like this to fear God. So the Christian doesn't fear that God will punish them, although they are introspective and they realize, maybe I'm deceived. <laughs> and they examine themselves throughout their Christian life, yes. But when they're most assured of God's love in Christ, they don't fear punishment, but they still fear God. You know why? Because He's God. And He's to be feared. Well, that's what it is. The fear of God. The beginning of wisdom. Wisdom 101 is that. Do you have it? nurture it do you not have it be terrified if you're sitting here and this means nothing to you and you're bored out of your mind you should be absolutely quivering with fear because this god's real but if you have it work it secondly though we must pose the question why this matters why does this matter for us today me and you 2017 in our lives this week. Oh, it matters. It's the beginning of wisdom. So you say, okay, sure. So if I don't fear God, I don't have wisdom. But so what? Who needs wisdom? Wisdom is a matter of life and death. Look at verse 17 here. I mean verse 11, my bad. This is wisdom speaking in the very next verse. By me, your days will be multiplied and years will be added to your life. The opposite is also true. The lack of me will bring death. Wisdom brings life, promises life. The lack of wisdom brings death. It's a matter of life and death, beloved. If you don't have wisdom, you don't have life. And if you don't have the fear of God, you don't have wisdom. Simple. It's a matter of life and death. What is wisdom worth? Turn with me to chapter 3 here of Proverbs. Chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. One of the high soaring, extolling of wisdom from the wordsmith Solomon. Blessed, that means happy. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. Okay, why? Who cares, Solomon? Because... The gain from her is better than gain from silver. And her profit is better than gold. She's more precious than jewels. And nothing you desire can compare with her. Do you believe that? If you had a big check coming tomorrow, you knew it. A million dollar check. All of us would be more excited about that than about Christ probably. Apart from God's grace. And yet here it is, the wisdom of God. Nothing you desire can compare with her. What do you desire? What is it that you want? What are your hopes banked upon this week or this year or in life? What are you hoping for? Nothing compares with wisdom. Wisdom is more valuable, more precious, more dear, more enriching than anything. Solomon knew what it was like to be rich and to have everything his heart desired. And he said wisdom far surpasses all those things it is better why 
verse 16. Long life is in her right hand. What does it matter what you have if you're not alive? What does it matter if you're dead? It doesn't matter what you've amassed, you leave it behind. It doesn't matter the experiences you have, they're gone. Nothing can comfort you in death apart from wisdom, because wisdom gives life. Long life. How long? Forever and ever and ever, as we'll see. That's long. Length of days she will add to your life. In her right hand, in her left hand, it says, are riches and honor. That comes too. Choose wisdom over riches and honor, and you will get life and riches and honor. He is no fool who gives up what he can't keep to gain what he will never lose, said the missionary. Verse 17, her ways are ways of pleasantness, of enjoying. The, the, the path of wisdom is joyful. The seeking of riches, the seeking of, of pleasures in this life, that's a hard path. Sure, you might taste of them, but that is a miserable road to follow. It's not enjoyable. All you think about is the next thing. You never stop to smell the roses. Wisdom is a path here. The, the way is pleasant. The whole seeking of wisdom is pleasant. It makes all of life into a paradise for those who have it. All her paths are peace. She, she is a tree of life. If there was any doubt that we were talking about eternal life in verse 16, verse 18 will lay that to rest. She's a tree of life. What's a tree of life? Eat and live forever. Tree of life. You think Solomon knew Genesis early chapters? Of course he did. She's a tree of life. Wisdom is a tree of life to all who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed, happy. This is about eternal happiness, this little passage here. It's a matter of life and death. And nothing that you presently desire, nothing that your present hopes are set upon can compare with wisdom. What is wisdom? What, what is real wisdom? Fear. Fear. That's where it starts. Fear of God. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? But it's real. That's the path of real wisdom. Okay. It's the beginning of wisdom. So again, why does it matter? We're continuing to answer that question now. Why does it matter? Well, at first it matters because it's a matter of life and death and wisdom is more precious than anything you could possibly desire. Wisdom is the be fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, the entrance, the door of wisdom. And if you don't go through the door, but you climb up by another way, you're a thief and a robber and not truly wise. Because wisdom, fear of the Lord is the door. It's the beginning. It's the headwaters. It's the source. It's where it all starts. It's the entry path. And if you don't enter that path, you're never on the path of wisdom. No one is wise who doesn't fear God. No one. They may be wise in a worldly sense, but what's that worth? That's not true wisdom. It's foolishness. They may be intelligence. That's not what we're talking about. It's not a matter of intelligence. You could be an intelligent fool... Like Romans chapter 1 says, many of our scientists are today. Very, very smart idiots. Wisdom is not about intelligence or getting a good score. It's about wisdom and life. And no one who doesn't fear God has it. Period. If you know someone who's not a believer, who is not wise, who is a fool biblically, you better drive them here, the fear of God. Work that they might fear God, that they might enter wisdom. It's the beginning. No wisdom and life without this. We go to chapter 1 here of Proverbs to see this in action. Proverbs is a wonderful book. And he doesn't get into the Proverbs proper till chapter 10. And the first nine chapters are this, this description of wisdom to work up our affections for it to show us how glorious wisdom is. And wisdom, it turns out, is a street preacher in chapter 1 here. Now, verse 20 here, wisdom cries aloud in the street. I'm going to use that one next time we're out. In the markets, she raises her voice. That's where wisdom is, preaching to the crowds. 
But I'm going to read uh, verses 24 through 33 here. This is what wisdom has to say for those who don't listen to her. Because I've called, it's not just an offer. Oh, you don't want me? It's okay. You know, everything's going to be all right. You don't, you don't really need me. You're all right. No. Verse 24, Proverbs chapter 1. Because I've called and you refuse to listen, I've stretched out my hand. Think about that. God's wisdom has reached out its hand to all. What a gesture. But because I've done that and no one has heeded, because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. Wow. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Wisdom says to those who won't hear her now, your terror is coming. Calamity is coming upon you. Death is coming. The hour of terror will strike all of mankind. And in that hour of death, when they are entering into the presence of God to stand before Him and their calamity comes and they cry out to wisdom that they rejected all their life, they don't get her. Now's the chance to get wisdom. She's offered to all eternal life given. But wisdom will turn right around and laugh and mock at those who reject her. Again, God's not like us. God's not like who you think he is. He's not in the pretty little box. He's not the grandfather in in the sky. He mocks and laughs at sinners when terror strikes them. He bites back. He's God. And he wins. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of this. Right. Well, what, what does it all mean for us here this morning? I, I could, as I always say, I could, I could leave the sermon here. And those of you who are in Christ, you know how to apply this. You know how this will help you walk with God. But I must bring it explicitly home to all of our consciences. When we talk about wisdom in the book of Proverbs, who are we really talking about? We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about Christ. Think about it. This wisdom that's promised here is a wisdom that gives spiritual life. A spiritual relationship with God and eternal life. If you're really believing what's said here, Wisdom's a tree of life. That's eternal life. So wisdom gives eternal life. Okay, that's our first clue. That wisdom here is much more than just a principle. Wisdom gives eternal life. It's not, it's not by accident that wisdom is portrayed in these first chapters as a person, personified. Right? And some of you will take this and say, Jesus, therefore Jesus is a woman. <laughs> wisdom is personified in such a way that we are left thinking, man, it, wisdom is not just a thing, but it's a person. Wisdom's a person that interacts with people. Now, we're in chapter 9 here where we find ourselves, but the speech here is not directly connected, but it's sort of a continuation of chapter 8, which is one of the mightiest speeches of wisdom in all of Proverbs. Uh, for instance, verse 22 here, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of, wor- of His works, the first of His acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Later, when He assigned to the sea its limit, when He marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside Him like a master workman. I'm oh, confusing the genders here. I was, wisdom says, 
when God created the world, I was with him as a master workman. Now, again, if you're believing what's said here, you know what that means? God created the world through this wisdom. This wisdom did the work. And then wisdom goes on here in verse 30. I was daily his delight, God's delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. Did you know that the church has always believed this passage is about Jesus Christ? The fiery uh, disputes of the Council of Nicaea, that when they hammered out the doctrine of the Trinity, this was one of the central texts that both Arius and Athanasius and the Trinitarians fought over. Because the church has always known instinctively that this wisdom that was with God forever through whom God created the world and was always God's delight, is God the Son, pictured here as wisdom. The church has always believed that. If I had time, I could demonstrate for you that all of these things here that are attributed to wisdom are also attributed to the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Is not He the one through whom God made the world? Is not He the first of God's creation, Colossians. He's the first of God's creation, just as wisdom says here, before it all, he got me. Doesn't mean Jesus is a creature. It means as it were, God <laughs> had a son in eternity past, as it were, was his first act. The one who was always God's delight this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Why do we say that God didn't need creation? Because God was always satisfied within Himself for all eternity past, within the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, delighting in each other forever, needing nothing, not just scraping by, surviving, full of satisfaction in each other. Now, if this is true, if the church has been right all along, and what I'm saying to you is right, and what Paul says is Christ has become unto us wisdom, then the fear of the Lord is not just the beginning of wisdom. We will say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of Christ, of knowing Christ. In other words, if you don't have the fear of the Lord, you don't have wisdom. And if you don't have the fear of the Lord, you don't have Christ. To know Christ happens through the fear of the Lord. To know Him first when you're converted and to know Him ongoing as a believer today. Your sense of the fear of God is directly connected with your knowledge of Christ ongoing as a Christian. If you lose sight of the fear of God, the majesty of God, the holiness of God, when that falls, your esteem of Christ falls inevitably. And this is what I'm going to tease out for the rest of the sermon. Then we're done. This is the beginning of Christ. No one trusts in Jesus until they see the fear of the Lord. No one. Period. That's what Jesus has promised for. He will save them from their sins. If somebody doesn't see that their sins cause them to be in great trouble with God, that they're going to die and be judged, why would they ever trust in Jesus to save them from their sins? They must see their sin. They must see their grave condition. They must see that God is in dead earnest with them, that the wrath of God abides on them, that there's no escape, no hiding, nothing they can do to smudge out a single sin. Until they see that, they'll never trust in Jesus. And if you trust in Jesus, you went through that. Maybe it was long. Maybe it was short. You went through it. You saw your sins and God's holiness and you said, I need help. Save me, oh God. You trusted in Christ to forgive you of your sins. All must pass through these gates and only then will Jesus be anything to them. That's why sinners trample upon the blood of Christ. That's why you did when the gospel was preached to you again and again before you believed. You trampled the, the blood of the Son of God because you didn't see it as necessary. You were okay. I don't need a little addition in my life. This is a little splash of religion or spirituality. That's all he was. 
He wasn't your very life. Because you didn't see. I like to read a selection here from Ian Murray, my favorite historian. Uh, this is from the book, uh, The Old Evangelicalism. You should all read it, especially you young men who want to preach. This is how he begins the book. He's com comparing the modern evangelicalism with the older evangelicalism. The danger, he says, of contrasting our own days with former times is a real one. It's easy to romanticize a past period with which we compare ourselves and then to judge our deficiencies by conditions that never existed as we imagined them. It, this admitted, the fact remains that there has been an element present when the gospel has made its swiftest advances in the world that is notably uncommon today, namely, the fear of God. Not only the experience, but the very words have all but disappeared. Yet its place in Scripture is unmistakable. Lest we suppose that the fear of God was a peculiarity of the New Testament Christianity, like the apostolic age, there's a consideration to check any such thought. It's that the same Spirit has ever reappeared in times when the gospel has been seen in its power. He goes on to speak about revivals, real revivals in our modern day and their connection with the fear of God. He says that before God sent revival, he says instances of conviction of sins had come to be regarded merely as mental depression and something to be avoided. In other words, before the fear of God strikes, when somebody is actually convicted about their sins, professing Christianity will just hush that up. They won't want to deal with that. They won't understand that because every praise song on KTIS is happy. They don't understand it. I'm picking on them today. That's not in my notes. There was a revival in 1859 in Scotland, and one eyewitness said this about it. Then, the one deep dominant note was an overpowering sense of sin. The sense of sin is not found in anything like the same degree today, he was writing later. There were old gray-headed men and women, young men and maidens, weeping and sobbing as if their hearts would break with sorrow. The realization of the presence of the Spirit of God was such as to overawe us so much that we dare not speak except in whispers as we tried to point those in agony of soul to the Savior. Of the great revival that began in Pyongyang, Korea in 1907, an eyewitness wrote this, Every man forgot every other. Each was face to face with God. I can hear yet that fearful sound of hundreds of men pleading with God for life, for mercy. The cry went out over the city till the heathen were in consternation. Looking up to the heavens to Jesus whom they had betrayed, they smote themselves and cried with bitter wailing, Lord, Lord, cast us not away forever. Everything else was forgotten. Nothing else mattered. Times of revival are invariably times of widespread spiritual concern. And he quotes W.G.T. Shedd. All great religious awakenings begin in the dawning of the august and terrible aspect of the deity upon the popular mind. And they reach their height and happy consummation in that love and faith for which the antecedent fear has been the preparation. In other words, nobody trusts in Jesus till they fear God. And that's the point of the fear of God. It's the beginning of wisdom. It is meant to come upon the sinner to grab them by the collar of their soul and drive them to Jesus as their only hope. That's what it does. And in revival, it does it in sweeping numbers by the thousands. But it's always there. 
No one trusts in Jesus till this. Why? Well, because the fear of God makes Jesus precious to us. When we read those descriptions of wisdom in, in chapter 3, 13 through 18, wisdom is more precious than jewels. Nothing you desire can compare with you. She's a tree of life. Substitute Christ in there. Because that's what Christ is. He is all those things. More precious than silver, more precious than gold is my Jesus to me. More valuable than anything I could hope for is the Lord Jesus Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. Long life is in his right hand. He is the tree of life. Knowing the fear of God makes Jesus precious to us. It makes Jesus necessary to us and not a moment sooner. The only people who trust in Jesus are people that know they have to trust in Jesus. And the only people that know they have to trust in Jesus are people that know their sin before God period. The fear of God makes Jesus necessary to us. He makes Jesus everything to us. We don't want anything else. We will part with everything. We're like the man who sells everything he has to buy the field where the treasure is. The merchant who sells all that he has to buy the pearl of great price. That's what the sinner does when they see Jesus in light of their sin. He becomes everything to us. If Jesus is not everything to you, if you've lost your affection for the Lord Jesus Christ, if the word of God is dull to you, Go back to the fear of God, and you will find again why Jesus is everything to you. This makes Jesus our joy. This is the only way, beloved, that you will ever dance for joy before God when you realize what you are and what you deserve and what God has given to you freely in Christ as a gift, not earned, given. When you realize that Jesus drank your cup for you, all the wrath you deserve down to the last drop, that God in Jesus Christ gives full royal pardons of sinners, that he nailed all your sins to the cross. Until you see the fear of God, that won't mean much to you. But when you see the fear of God, Jesus will become your exceeding joy. You will be like those who dream when you realize that God loves me and God has redeemed me but not a moment sooner. And the fear of God makes Jesus Christ our strength. He's our strength, beloved. When we are weak, He is strong. It's through Jesus Christ that we overcome. It's through Jesus Christ that we conquer. It's through Jesus Christ that we kill sin. It's through Him and Him alone that we can do those things because we're leaning on Him in the fear of God. As one man put it, God is your worst nightmare's worst nightmare. And when you're in Christ, and you still fear God because He's God, but you realize this living God says to you, I'm with you. I'm on your side. I'm for you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will fight for you. Then you realize that this God is your worst nightmare's worst nightmare. And you're good because he's with you without the fear of God you have a sissy God who can't protect you we'll end with this verse 12 here where wisdom ends if you are wise you are wise for yourself if you scoff you lone bear it I can't do this for you your parents can't do it for you your spouse can't do it for you your children can't do it for you No one can do it for you but God. But the admonition here is you do it for yourself. If you're wise, you're wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. We are all in this alone. It's you and God. Yes, we're together. Yes, we live together. Yes, we will worship God together for eternity. Yes, we help each other. But when we get down to the brass tacks, beloved, it's you and it's God. Are you ready? Are you trusting in Christ? Or are you exposed to the wrath of God that hangs by a thread over your life? May the Lord help us to trust in Jesus (laughs) and all he is for sinners. Let's pray. Father, please make us think about who you are and who we are before you. And drive your truth home to our hearts. I do beg you to do so in Jesus' name. Amen.